Well, good morning. Well, as we get, kind of continue to gather here, I want to welcome you to Colonial Church this morning. My name is Aaron Roberts, and I'm very glad you're here this morning. As we begin our time together, in each one of our pews, we have a pew pad. And so that way we kind of know who's here. Take that out, place your name in that, and if you're sitting next to somebody that you don't know, make sure you've got a picture of their name right in front of you. You can greet them by name today. Also, we have a, there's so much going on in the world, so we have so many prayers. If there are prayers that you would like to be sure that either I'm aware of or that we're sharing in our church community, please fill out one of the prayer cards that's in each one of our pews. And then later in the service, place that in the offering plate. Um, I've got a couple announcements to hire. One is that this evening is Sunday night at the movies, and it's at 5.30, and that group is going to be watching The Boys Next Door. And all are welcome with the, uh, to watch the film, and then there's a little discussion that takes place afterwards. They only ask that you bring a snack to share. So you, gotta, you have to share. <laughs> Next Sunday, we are going to begin part two of our white privilege, um, our community's conversation on white privilege. Now, this conversation is on race is an extremely timely conversation right now. And it is, um, if you didn't, didn't take part in part one of the Let's Talk conversations, which was last winter, that's fine. What you can do is, if you look in the bulletin today, you can download the curriculum and then take that curriculum and, um, and uh, we ask that you write your spiritual autobiography. All the instructions are in there. And then bring that, everybody should bring it, even if you took it last time, bring that to our session next Sunday. Um, so please take part in this. These are important conversations. Race is at the heart of so much that is happening in our world and in our nation. And one of the commitments that we have in the middle of this is that, that this conversation, the transformation that needs to happen, needs to start in the side of you before it can start in the world. And so that's, that's where we begin with this. And so with that in mind, we hope you are there. It will be after our second service here, beginning next Sunday, and then it will skip a couple Sundays, and we'll finish up uh, with uh, three sessions in the month of October. As we begin today, um, I'd like you to consider an advertisement from a few years ago for a tech device. And it's, this ad is different from any ad for a tech device, a tablet, or a phone that I've seen. Take a, take a look. By all the rules of advertising, that's a horrible ad. It doesn't even articulate at any point in it what they're even trying to sell. And yet, it's strangely impactful. It puts out a vision for what you can create. It's a vision of passion. Today we're going to be looking at those things and those activities in our lives, that stuff, that intangible stuff that makes certain movements, certain people great and not just good. 
And maybe, just maybe, during the course of this morning, you will catch a glimpse inside of you of the power and the potential that God has put in you. So out of, re out of respect and reverence, this morning we worship. And we worship not just any God, but we worship the God who is good and all the time. So let's worship. Let's rise now to worship this good God of power and love with our opening hymn, We Worship You, God, which is 26 in our hymnal or on screen. announcement here. Mary Lee has to, has to get out and she would like to tell you a little bit about something that's important that's upcoming. My darn husband, if he'd only change his days off, <laughs> I wouldn't be in this predicament. I want to do a quick little um, comment for um, the rummage sale that's coming up. And so I'm going to have the audience help me. Whoever has page number one, read that out loud to everybody. Number two. Three. 
And am I on four now? Am I in six or seven? I can't even count. Go. I have eight. Um, countdown to Colonial's annual rummage sale, dropping off your items for the sale on the following days. October 8th is the first day we can drop off from 11.30 to 1.30. And I wanted to mention we need helpers. We need people to help unload cars and to help move furniture. Then we have October 13th from noon to 5, October 14th, 9 to 3, October 15th, 11.30 to 4. Who's got number nine? Thank you, everybody. Let me just show you how, we, how the rummage sale can be um, a recycling event. I bought this wonderful jacket and wore it over some beautiful cream linen pants for several years. After retirement, I gained nine pounds. Cannot wear it anymore. Guess where it's going to go? I'm going to redonate it. So we're going to hopefully sell it again, and it'll have made its price twice. I bought these books last year at the rummage sale. Done reading them. Guess what I'm doing with them? recycling them. So think about things you might have purchased in the past that maybe just didn't work out and see if you can drop those off too. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lee. We are frail children of dust. What are human beings, Lord, that you know them all? What are human beings that you even consider them? Humans are like a puff of air. Their days go by like a shadow. Is this all there is to life? Is this the life that God intends? Let's come together now for a moment of truth with God. Will you pray with me? Fear, Fear surrounds, surrounds us. Fear that Fear we that could we lose our, our health, health insurance. insurance. Fear, Fear that, that we, we won't have, have enough, enough to retire. retire. Fear that, that our lives will be lived out, out in quiet desperation. God, God you, you promise, promise so much more. You promise a way that leads to a full and abundant life. Inspire us to a vision of your holy way today. What holds you down today? In honest prayer and in the presence of God, name your fear. Even in the face of fear, God's spirit gives us strength to stand free. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. By the power of Christ's grace, you have what you need. Take hold of it today. Amen. Please rise. has placed a treasure inside of you, inside of every person. When you grab hold of the full life that was intended for you, 
You can live this life free from fear. You are greater than you can imagine. And there is so much potential in this room. And so I'd like you to now greet everyone here with the hope of friendship and peace. Jean. Run. Let's all stand up. Okay? Let's come down here. I know. It's a good thing. Flip flops might be hard to run in. Okay. So you ready? Let's start. Let's start running. Okay. So we're running along. We're running along and we're running along. And then all of a sudden we hit a pothole. Oh. Oh. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, let's get back up and we got to run some more. Okay. So we're running and we go up a little hill and then we go down the hill. Okay. We're running. We're running. Here comes a curve. We're curving to the right. Okay, get around the curve. Okay, now we're gonna go up a hill. Oh, this is a bigger hill. We go up the hill, and we get to the top of the hill, and we come down. Oh, that's good. So much better going down the hill than up. Okay, we run, and we run, and we run, and we have to jump over a little stream, and we run, and we run, and we run. You feel like you're playing Frogger all of a sudden. We're running, and we're running, and we're running, and now, Oh my goodness, there's a huge hill. We are going on the path of life. We are going up the hill, up the hill, up the hill, up the hill, and all of a sudden, there's no more ground. Oh, we stop, right? We're at a cliff. And if you don't know what a cliff looks like, I've got a picture, okay? This is, this is a, uh, in Norway, there's a fjord down here, and there's this huge rock that goes straight up. And at the top of the rock, there's another rock that kind of juts out to the side. You see there's a, actually a person standing on there doing yoga. Warrior pose. Yeah. Okay. So, it's natural that we stop when we get to the top of that hill, right? When we come to that edge of the cliff, we stop because we don't want to fall. Yeah? What would happen if we fell? Yeah, exactly, right? But what if... What if you had different tools? What if you had a hang glider? Hang gliding, that sounds like fun, doesn't it? Right? Awesome, awesome. Okay, so what if we had, what if we didn't want a hang glide? This is my personal favorite. A wingsuit. Now is that not awesome? That is so cool. It's like a, it's like a flying squirrel, right? They've got the flaps of skin here and here and here. Right? They just, it's really cool. That's what life is like. When we run, we hit potholes. We have to jump over streams. We go up hills. We go down hills. We've got tools. We've got all kinds of tools. You've got tools right here in this room. You see all those people out there? They're tools. Not to <laughs> oh, that sounded awful, didn't it? I am so sorry. So where are you going with that? <laughs> Let me try this again. So, <laughs> there, the, yes, instruments of help. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate your help. See, and there was help right there. Yeah. Wow. Didn't think that one through. Um, but <laughs> they're here to help you, right? There's an even bigger help out there. What about God's love, right? Sometimes 
he puts hills in our path because it teaches us. It teaches us to jump a little further, to fly a little higher, so that when we hit those cliffs, we'll have a wingsuit and we can just soar, yeah? It just gives us the power to continue forward and be all that we can possibly be because that's what life is really all about. It's about making the most of it, getting every ounce of life out of the life that you have. We say it at the end of every sermon, right? Every time we finish, right? Live your life from now until its finale. Live it, yeah? Don't just walk through it. So with that, let's have a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for helping us to fly. Amen. And forgive us those tools out there. So nobody at the first service got this one, so we'll see if we've got some good history buffs out here at the second service. Get your hand up if you know who Samuel Pierpont Langley was. Anybody? Yes, all right, one. Anybody, okay. Well, all right, all right. Largely, Samuel Pierpont Langley has been forgotten over the past century. But there was a time where pretty much everybody in this room, if you had gone back just a century ago, you all would have known who Samuel Pierpont Langley was because he was the guy who was going to build the first airplane. By all the rules of business, he had the right stuff. He had secured a grant from the War Department. That's what they used to call the Defense Department. 
And it was the equivalent today of millions of dollars. And he was the person who was going to figure this whole flying thing out. He was on the board of Harvard, and he could recruit the best and the brightest talent anywhere in the nation. The New York Times had assigned a reporter to follow him around daily to report on the development and eventual success of the first working airplane. So he had it all. He had the big three that you're looking for. He had the best minds, financial capital, and resources. So why don't you know about him? Because he didn't build the airplane. Because these two financially strapped bicycle mechanics from the Midwest, they're the ones who actually built the airplane, the Orville and Wilbur Wright, the Wright brothers. They had the right stuff. Jesus of Nazareth was a carpenter with no formal education. He pulled together a team of not exactly the best and brightest. As Jesus walked along the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, throwing fishing nets into the sea because they were fishermen. Come follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away they left their nets and they followed him. Continuing on, he saw another set of brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee with their father, repairing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. It's almost like they didn't have anything better to do. And yet, what this team of completely randomly selected people as Jesus one day was walking down by a lake. What they would do over the next few years, what they would do with their lives, would change and shape the world from then until now. What is it that sets certain people apart? Why do certain people certain movements, certain companies, why do they change the world when most just struggle to get by? In the first week of this series, we considered what the right kind of environment brings out the best in people. It's one where people are safe and they feel supported in what they're doing. Then last week, we turn to the incredible life of the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. But what made him the icon that he is today? Why him? There were hundreds of thousands of people back in 1963 who came here to hear him speak at, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. People from all over the nation. And this is in a time where there was no social media. There was no advertising campaign. And yet, people heard and came. People came from miles around to hear Jesus preaching in a wilderness. They would travel for days to come all the way up from Jerusalem into Galilee just to hear an uneducated carpenter and with his flock of illiterate fishermen. And yet we gather in his name today. Why? What made these people great? Martin Luther King was a gifted orator, no doubt. But he wasn't the best preacher alive. For those theologians, we also know he probably wasn't the best theologian of all time either. He wasn't the only African American to have suffered injustice and indignity. 
not by a long shot. And he wasn't the only person who was working for civil rights. Not even close. So why him? If you can wrap your minds and your heart around the answer to this, you might access incredible potential inside yourself. Orville and, Orville and Wilbur Wright had no college degrees. Financially, they were just getting by with their bi bicycle shop. And I'll tell you, the New York Times was definitely not following them around to see what their next move was going to be. In fact, on the day of the actual first working airplane flight, there was no media present at all. But what got them up in the morning, what fed their dreams at night, was a vision of a world that was going to be changed by airplanes. Samuel Pierpont Langley didn't build the first airplane. He wanted to, but he didn't have the right stuff. All his best and brightest engineers, they worked for a paycheck. Orville and Wilbur Wright worked for a dream. When the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. preached that sermon on the Lincoln Memorial, he preached a dream of a world where all children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. He didn't preach a plan. How did he get to that point? Because we're still working on that. But he preached a dream. And it was a dream that was rooted in his Christian faith. When Jesus Christ launched a ministry that would unite and eventually bring together millions of people for the healing and insisting on the injustice for all the people of the world, he did not spell out the details. He preached parables, powerful parables of truth, of power, that the real spiritual power of people, when they are inspired, working together, can bring this world to a vision of what he called the kingdom of God. A kingdom that is greater than any nation, any empire. A kingdom that would outlast them all. A vision that would endure and inspire to this very day. That's the vision that Martin Luther King Jr. had. It was an inspired vision from Jesus himself of what could be possible today. What separates a perfectly fine plan from a world-changing movement is a dream of what could be. You saw the advertisement that we began with. You heard the children's service. It's what Apple gets that other tech companies don't. Is that tech isn't about devices. It's about a vision of how life can be better, might be changed by them. For over a year, Jesus' team of disciples traveled with him. They heard the vision of a kingdom, a world where all people had access to healing, education, food, and clean water. It was a world where all people shared a little so that none suffered a lot. And then Jesus turned them loose. Jesus called the twelve together and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to heal sickness. He sent them out to proclaim God's kingdom and to heal the sick. 
I believe that we live in a time where we are haunted by demons. Demons of racism. Demons of selfish greed. Demons of fear. Demons that need to be driven out. And even as our medical knowledge increases exponentially, healing, healing is attempted to be hoarded by those with the resources to access it. And that's not a Jesus thing. He poured out the best healing for all people. I believe that the vision of God's kingdom is as needed now as it always has been. I believe that Jesus' Holy Spirit continues to infect people. And I believe that that's worth everything. I believe it's worth my energy. I believe it's worth my resources. I believe that it's worth my life itself because it is simply that good for this world and it is so necessary. Yes, you can go through this life moving from paycheck to paycheck, working on a plan, and those are necessary plans. They sustain life. Working on a plan to allocate your resources in a way that you won't run out of resources to access decent health care and food and water before you die. That's a life. Or you can grab hold of some passion in this life. Tell people who are rich at this time not to become egotistical and not to place their hope on their finances, which are uncertain. Instead, they need to hope in God, who richly provides everything for our enjoyment. Tell them to do good, to be rich in the good things they do, to be generous, and to share with others. When they do these things, they will save a treasure for themselves that is a good foundation for the future. That way, they can take hold of what is truly life. That, that, Friends, grab hold of a dream of what life could be like if you were free. Free at last from the demons of fear and of greed and of hate. Do the good that you know will make this world better. Don't be satisfied with just getting by, but use the days that you have to make this life extraordinary. It's all you got. God's vision for you in this world didn't die at some point in the past. It can be resurrected in you. Live this life passionately. Do what feeds your soul. No matter who you are, whether you're a literate fisherman, CEO of a company, it matters not if you cannot find the greatness of spirit, the right stuff, the stuff that's inside of you and live fully. This is my prayer for you and for me this morning. Live the dream. Jesus once said, people do not live by bread alone. We live. We truly live when we live for a vision. Let's rise together and pray that in song with our hymn, Be Now My Vision. It's number 451 in our hymnal or on screen.
please be seated. This church community exists to help any person to grow as the best possible version of themselves. Together, we come around a vision of a better world that we might contribute a verse. That is our Christian service and duty. We give now to support that vision. Will our ushers please receive our offering? Please rise.
The power. God has placed power and spirit in you as you grow and find and use that power. May we always do it in God's holy name. Let's pray that as we pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Peace. Peace on the inside, and peace that our world needs. Those come from the choices that we make every moment, every day. Let's close this holy time now in prayer. Let there be peace on earth, which is on pages 6 and 7 of the bulletin or on screen. Let's stand together in prayer. I hope that you have got, you have heard something, that you have felt something of hope in this time. I hope that you have a vision for a way of living in this world that makes a difference, makes your life different. A vision for the world the way God would have it be. Next Sunday, we have two special things coming up that I know you're going to want to be here for. One is that we are going to consecrate the new chapel down the other side of the building. And I want to tell you something. I understand this chapel is enough to make Kirk Carson skip like a calf. <laughs> if it does that, it's worth coming to. So we might want to see that skip or something next Sunday. And also, if you talk about how passion can transform life, 
We're going to have a message next week from our own Dr. Stacy Algren as she shares her ministry in Malawi. As we walk together, we grow. That's what the journey is about. God works through communities like this one to grow, to enable disciples to find the best version of themselves inside and to grow into the greatness that exists in you. We covenant together to be that kind of community. And so I ask you to renew that covenant now as you turn toward the center aisle and you make our covenant with God and with one another. And if you're not ready to make this covenant, that is perfectly fine. Please receive it then as a blessing and a prayer that someday you will. We covenant with the Lord and with one another. And you bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in Christian love. We seek to worship God in spirit and in truth and to love our neighbors as ourselves. With God's help, we will honor Colonial Church in our conduct, support its program, and extend the influence of Christ throughout the world. God be with you. God be with you. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you. Our time of worship is now over. But our time of service to a vision begins now. So go, you are turned loose in freedom to live this life passionately and love faithfully and celebrate every moment of your life from now until your life's finale. Because what you will find is that our God of resurrecting grace goes with you always. Amen.